I had mentioned radar earlier. What led to the development of radar then in, in the peninsula? We'll have to go back a little bit in time. Um, prior to uh, World War II, mm -hmm. um, the British had invented a radar and built it and deployed it. It was called Chain Home. It worked at very low frequencies. It was primitive. It was huge. But it gave them uh, advance warning that enemy planes were in the air uh, approximately so far out, but only in a 90 degree sector. So uh, that was the genesis of, of, of radar. But I think unbeknownst to the British and other, other activities were underway that were, were completely different, and only later did they converge. So in the 30s, we were kind of going into a war, probably, as I covered uh, in my talk. Uh, tell me a little bit about the guys who uh, developed the, uh, the microwave stuff uh, there at Stanford, the Claystron, and what was their motivation? What got them going? What was their thought process? Well, you know, the, the, the Varian story is uh, a fairy tale. Uh, uh, Russ and Sig both uh, grew up in Palo Alto. Russ went to Varian, uh, had troubles. He was dyslexic. Uh, Sig was a Pan Am pilot. Um, ex experienced difficulties flying through fog, landing, uh, you know, in difficult conditions. Um, so after Russ got uh, out of Stanford, they decided they wanted to go start a laboratory, uh, try to invent something. Uh, but after a short time, they realized that they probably bit off more than they could chew and went back to Stanford. Mm -hmm. And uh, there they hooked up with, uh, with Bill Hansen, who, who had, had been a friend and associate of, of Russ in school. Uh, Hansen is a card-carrying genius. Mm -hmm. and, and, and by the way, uh, Dave Leeson is here tonight. Where's Dave? Dave, Where's the back? Dave is 2,600 pages, he, he tells me into writing the story of Hansen's life, and he's not through yet. So we expect him up here one of these nights, but maybe not over the next six months. Uh, uh, and I'm sure it's gonna be fantastic. Uh, also, uh, Dave has uh, published a, a paper, a short article, called uh, Two Days in August. It's the story of uh, the founding of Hewlett Packard and invention of the Klystron, which occurred in August 1937 within a one-week time span. So I'm sure you can make that available to, to, to the audience. Yes, we'll make a link to that. Anyway, uh, Varians are back at Stanford trying to invent something, and I guess the approach was Russ would think, which is kind of a novel idea if you're going to invent something, mm -hmm. and uh, then he'd write it down, his ideas in his notebook, uh, give them to Hanson, Hansen would say, well, that's not gonna work. Yeah. And after a dozen or so, though, I guess he came up with one that, uh, that he couldn't find anything wrong with. Uh, they built a, a model in a month, and it worked. And uh, I'm not gonna spend much time on it, because I think we're kind of pressed here, but uh, uh, it was a very unique idea that fun came, overcame the fundamental problem that limited high-frequency operation and, and that was transit time. So you think Russ would uh, be, be admitted as an employee of Varian or a professor at Stanford today? Uh, I don't know, but I think he would have had trouble getting in Stanford today. <laughs> <laughs> I think so, but he was one of those thinkers that came up with ideas. So how did they find funding? Do you have any idea how he uh, managed to keep this thing going during the 30s? Well, no, the deal with, uh, with initially with uh, with Stanford was they would get some amount a month, I don't know, 50 bucks or something like that. Mm -hmm. And Stanford got uh, some substantial patent rights if anything was invented. Okay. But then after uh, the invention, I mean, this was recognized as a big deal, mm -hmm. you know, from the get-go. Uh, and Sperry Gyroscope uh, came out and negotiated a contract where they had uh, access to the technology, uh, the Varians and their staff, which friends would work for them. And for that, they paid around $22,000. So uh, the Varians and, and Bill Hansen got together and put this together from 1937 through 39. And you've got a uh, cover here on the Palo Alto Times, the front page. Tell us a little bit about what you're seeing there. I, I don't remember where I found this, uh, this uh, paper, but it may, it may have been at Slack. Uh, but it's quite amazing to see that 
on the same day that the Kleistron was announced is that there's a picture of, of Hitler and a warning, let us alone. Yeah, I'm only going to take one more country and then you can be okay. But the key, the key headline there was the announcement of the invention of the Kleistron at Stanford by the Varian brothers. Kind of neat. So uh, radar goes back a little ways. Can you talk a little bit about what, what some of the uh, uh, motivation was? Were people doing experiments? What were they looking for? Well, um, you, you know, it was to be able to see where they otherwise couldn't mm -hmm. see, either because of distance or because of fog or, or rain or, or whatever. What about the death ray challenge? The what? The death ray challenge. Oh. Describe that one. Well, um, yes. b before the British uh, invented this radar I, I spoke about called mm -hmm. Chain Home, they realized they were in a desperate situation. Mm -hmm. And uh, nobody had any good ideas. Uh, so the British had had some success in, in running competitions for ideas, and they ran one for uh, what they called the Death Ray Prize. We call it the X Prize today. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, uh, the challenge was build something that can kill a sheep at 100 yards. Um, and uh, so this was circulated. Uh, uh, one uh, group looked at it, and uh, their boss told them to look at it. And uh, they came back and said, you know, this is, this is absurd. It won't work. You know, nobody can do that. Um, but, uh, you know, what's the real problem here? Maybe we can help in a different way. They described the real problem. They said, oh, well, you know, we've noticed that when airplanes fly by our, uh, our radio, there's interference. So that's what mm -hmm. kind of connected the dots and led to experiments pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then the, the chain home. And then they tried uh, klystrons in that application and they weren't that successful. What, what was the dis issue with the klystrons? Well, although chain home was a gigantic step forward, and it, the wasn't, it wasn't, wasn't enough. Mm -hmm. It's not enough. Uh, and they understood that. They, they understood that to get more precise range and, mm -hmm. and direction, they needed higher frequencies. And they were going to get it out of triodes, those kind of things. Um, so that's why the Klystron was, you know, such a fantastic, mm -hmm. important invention. And the British set about to take the Klystron idea and, and make a tube uh, with sufficient power that it could power a radar. Mm -hmm. uh, so a couple guys, uh, Boot and Randall, uh, were working on that. No success. Uh, as engineers do, they said, well, let's try something else. And uh, they tried what turned, came, came to be uh, uh, the magnetron, a cavity magnetron. And, and this was a fantastic invention. Uh, the klystrons at that point were quite low power. Uh, magnetrons were limited in frequency. Mm -hmm. And they managed to achieve higher frequency operation and high power operation. They went from watts to kilowatts in a, in a very short time. So experimenting, playing with these things, seeing what the modes were, how to couple them, gave them something that really turned out the power they needed for high, high frequency, microwave frequency, that they could use in radars. That's right. And so the magnetrons then were used in the transmitters and klystrons and receivers? Correct. Okay. And we have the cavity mag magnetron here. Uh, a lot of theory went into that uh, and a lot of development. I think it was more cut and try. They kind of had, okay. in, had intuition. All these things were intuition. I mean, you know, Russ, Cock, Russ Varian did not, uh, you know, sit down with his slide rule and math and, and design a klystron. He, mm -hmm. he envisioned it. Uh, same, we're talking about the trailing wave tube. Same way, same way here. Mm -hmm. Well, meanwhile, this is the uh, early, early 40s, and we've got the uh, bombing of London and so on. And so these were called in during that time, or was it later that the magnetron radar well, it, it, it all happened in, incredibly fast. The, the British realized they were on something good and felt that uh, by sharing that technology with the U.S., it could go faster and maybe they'll get something back, mm -hmm. which they did. Uh, so uh, the, the technology was transferred uh, and, and there was an incredible uh, amount of effort in, in America to bring this uh, idea to fruition. Uh, and that touched the West Coast in that Sperry moved, the, you know, the, the varying guys east, German went east, yeah. um, Lincoln uh, Lytton, Lytton went east, 
uh, Rad Lab got started, so on and so forth. And and in uh, you know a very short time, then this went from an idea to uh, fantastic production. Uh, Raytheon was in the middle of it. Raytheon had like 20 employees that started. Uh, shortly after that, they had 18,000 employees making 2,000 magnetrons a day. And these ended up in radars and airplanes, ships, ground, everywhere. So what are we seeing in this picture here of the uh, this ground-based radar? Uh, this is earlier or is this the microwave? No, th yeah, this is micro. Okay. This is World War II. And you can see it takes, you know, a couple of vehicles and trailers and, uh, you know, and fill the parking lot for, for a pretty primitive radar that's not as good as the one Charlie Eddie does on a sailboat. <laughs> They're nicer today, aren't they? <laughs> and uh, they were also able to put them in right, airplanes? Right, right. And, and, and that was because the high frequency meant that the size of everything could be shrunk. Mm -hmm. 